So before the invention of printing, artists who wanted to have multiple copies of a work had to copy it over by hand, one production at a time. Um, printing or printmaking is a way to make multiple copies of images or text without having to copy each one by hand. Um, now there are a variety of printmaking techniques, each with its own sort of unique set of characteristics. Um, and some of these date back to ancient civilizations, while others are um, more modern techniques. Um, for example, ancient Egyptian and Mesopotamian civilizations reproduced images by rolling incised cylindrical stones across um, clay or wax slabs to create relief impressions. Um, these would have been used as perhaps seals um, on um, messages, things like that, perhaps seals on grain or beer barrels just to show that they hadn't been opened. Um, and Chinese craftspeople used wooden stamps and ink to print pattern designs on textiles um, as early as the 8th century BCE. Um, printmaking is really important in the spread of images. Um, so where painting is sort of one of a kind, um, here you can have multiples of a single work. Um, so an artist can create an addition, um, which is two or more identical images that are signed and numbered by the artist. Or they can create a monoprint, which is more like a painting. It's a singular, one of a kind print. Um, now, printing is not always done by the artist, but if they create the master image, supervise the printing process, and sign the print, it's considered an original. Um, however, printmaking is much more than just making copies of original artworks. Many artists use it because they like the process or the effects that it creates. Now, there are three main families of printmaking that we're going to look at. Uh, relief printmaking, intaglio printmaking, and planographic printmaking. We'll start with relief printmaking. So relief, as we already know, means raised. Um, the artist carves away the negative space from a block of material, leaving behind a raised image. Um, so traditionally, relief printmaking uses wood blocks or wood cuts. Um, so the artist uses a block of wood and cuts out the negative space and leaves behind the raised image. Um, Woodcuts hold up relatively well under pressure, but you can only create a limited number of additions with them because the edges of the relief will begin to deteriorate over time. Um, more modern relief printmaking often uses linoleum instead of wood, um, and this is called a lino cut. So linoleum is much softer than wood, so it's easier to carve. Um, you can create smoother lines. You don't have to worry about uh, the grain of the wood or splitting or anything like that. And it's a relatively cheap material. Um, but either way, whether you use wood or linoleum or something else, um, the artist, after carving the block, then applies ink to the raised surface. Uh, the recessed areas or the negative spaces are not inked at all. And then the transfer of the image to paper is done by applying pressure. So think of it like a stamp. Um, but you also have to consider that in this process, the print is mirrored from the block. So if your print includes any letters or words, they must be carved into the block backwards so that when it is printed, they will read regularly. So the German artist Albert Durer used woodcut printing or woodblock printing um, here in his Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse from about 1497 to 98. Now this comes from a series of about 15 illustrations made when Durer was about 27 years old. Um, and these were all illustrating scenes from the biblical book of Revelation. So Durer... Um, Durer commissioned professional block cutters to carve the layering and highly detailed lines of his original drawing into a block of wood. 
Now, the block was made of glued stacks of thin sliced wood layers um, to make a more stable print block that was less likely to splinter or crack during carving um, than a solid block of wood was. Um, and so the combination of the specially prepared block and the professional block cutters um, results in these very thin lines and details that would really hold up with repeated printing here. So the book of Revelation is um, a book of sort of symbolic writing that kind of prophesies the apocalypse or the end of the world in the Bible. Um, and this is perhaps the most famous illustration from this series by Durer. Um, and he is showing us the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So from left to right, we have, <clears throat> um, we have death here, and we have famine, war, and plague. These are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So notice as they are sweeping into the scene, Death is sort of this sickly old man on a sickly, feeble-looking horse, but he's trampling over all of these individuals in front of him, sort of indiscriminately sweeping citizens and nobles, even a king, uh, into the jaws of Hades here. Now, the subject of the four horsemen kind of arriving at the apocalypse was traditionally relatively still and stagnant, uh, but Durer has injected really a sense of kind of energy and motion, maybe even danger, um, through the use of these kind of strong diagonal lines, um, implied diagonal in the composition or the arrangement of the figures here. Um, and he's also achieved different tones or values uh, through hatching. So the carvers um, cut thin lines close together to create this kind of dark, <clears throat> excuse me, to create these dark recesses within the wood block that then transfer into a good amount of detail when printed. Um, but you might notice something. Um, we've got hatching here, but no cross-hatching, which we already know increases the depth of value, right? Now, why might that be? Well, in a wood block or a wood cut, um, if we did cross-hatching, it would simply remove large chunks of this block, right? Um, if you think about it, think about cutting into a wood block and then changing the direction, cutting um, across the cuts you've already made. That's just going to create an X and remove kind of that central chunk of wood, which would totally throw off the composition here. So he's transferring kind of traditional drawing techniques to a new medium, to woodcut printing, um, but you can't do that indiscriminately. He's really thinking it through here. And many artists really preferred printmaking for its affordability and for its potential to reach a wider audience. So when an artist can create relatively cheaply several prints or copies of a singular work, um, those can then be distributed widely amongst a sort of wide variety of viewers or a larger audience. So they're putting their work out there and getting more, um, getting more views, sort of. Um, so Kathy Kollitz, a German artist, um, we've looked at her a bit before, but her art often confronts social injustice and suffering, specifically the poverty, war, death, grief, um, hunger, and motherhood, all of these experiences that she saw within her life. Um, and so here we have two woodblock or woodcut prints from a series titled War um, from 1921 to 22. Um, this series was a memorial to the sudden catastrophic loss caused by World War I. Um, on the left, we have the Widow One, um, and this is one of seven from the series. Um, and then on the right, we have the Widow Two. So in general, this series kind of features young soldiers, grieving mothers, widows, parents, etc., cetera, um, all focusing on the pain and sorrow of those left behind, as in those who have 
lost someone or something of great value because of this war. Um, so in the widow here, we have a young pregnant woman um, sort of overcome by mourning. She's protectively kind of covering her stomach with her arms and gazing down affectionately, but also sort of sadly. Um, she's very alone. She's been abandoned, likely after the death of her husband in the war. Um, so she is grieving, but also likely fearing the future. Um, on the right side, Widow 2, um, Kowitz takes that grief even further. Um, so presumably this is the same woman a bit later. Um, and this is sort of speaking to the poverty and hunger of these who are suffering, suffering the loss of the war. Um, so here we have the widow and her young child has died, likely because, as I said, they were poor, they didn't have food or anything to sort of take care of themselves. Um, and the mother here has taken her own life out of grief for the loss of her child and her family. Here's another print from the same series, this one titled The Mothers. Um, here we have a group of women kind of locked into this solid mass uh, that forms a protective barrier around the children, um, sort of implying that the mothers will stand together to prevent their children from marching off into any future wars. Um, we sort of have this defensive or anxious feeling within this composition kind of marks the sacrifice and suffering of these mothers and Colwitz herself felt that sacrifice and suffering. Um, she saw a lot of suffering throughout her lifetime. As a German woman living through two world wars, um, she saw, pretty much saw it all. Um, her own son, Peter, was killed in the early months of World War I, so this grief as a suffering mother is very relatable to her. And she's using the medium of, of relief printing to sort of expressively capture those feelings, really capitalizing on the high contrast between the black ink and the white paper um, and sort of these crisp lines. Uh, but she's also able to really capture some, some, um, some intricate details here. Now you might notice there is a bit of cross hatching there, which she would have had to be very careful in her carving. Um, but you can also sort of see how larger chunks have been removed, and therefore creating a larger negative space. For color woodblock prints, you have to create multiple blocks, essentially one for each color that you want to use in your final composition. Um, a good example of that is Hokusai's Great Wave. Um, and this is actually pretty difficult. It requires a lot of planning because each block must be carved accurately and then perfectly aligned on the printing surface. Oftentimes artists will carve little notches along the sides of the block to help them align uh, correctly on the paper. But Hokusai's Great Wave here use, used, <clears throat> excuse me, nine blocks, and each of those blocks had to be printed on the same sheet of paper uh, to realize the final composition. So an estimated 5,000 plus prints were made of this composition. So nine times 5,000 is 45,000 presses per print, at least. So full color woodcut prints really first appeared in China. Linoleum printmaking is very similar to woodblock printmaking. Uh, it's done by carving into the surface of a material and then printing the raised surface left behind. Um, it's only, or the main difference really, is that instead of a block of wood, you use a block of linoleum as your matrix, and then the resulting prints are called lino cuts rather than wood cuts. Now, because linoleum in general is softer than most wood blocks and it does not have any kind of wood grain, many contemporary printmakers prefer it for relief printing. Um, so here we have an example by an artist, Stanley Donwood. Um, he produced a series and then a group of associated works that depicts the last days of the city of Los Angeles. Um, the series was titled Lost Angeles. Um, and so to create these works, he cut into 
through sheets of linoleum to create the image and then printed the results onto a very fine Japanese paper. The soft linoleum really allowed Dawnwood to capture the myriad of fictional events in great detail with a kind of clarity that a storybook illustration might have. Um, here's another lino cut example, this time by an artist named Sandil Goji. Um, this one is titled Meeting of Two Cultures, which the artist created at a rather transformative moment in South African history. Um, so apartheid, which is a system of segregation that gave white South Africans rights and opportunities that were not permitted of South African black citizens, um, it ended and freedom fighter Nelson Mandela was about to be elected president in about 1993-1994 when this work was created. Um, the artist wanted to represent this historical moment and created this composition with two houses kind of coming together and shaking hands. Uh, to the left side we have a traditional South African house kind of striding forward on black legs. It reaches out and grasps the white hand of a western brick house wearing dress pants and loafers. Um, for the artist, the houses coming together represented a new hope for his nation. Um, but in terms of the, um, the media and process here, linoleum, printmaking, or lino cuts, you can really see the path that um, the artist has kind of gouged using a sharp semicircular tool, um, kind of penetrating the linoleum and scooping away each piece of material. At the bottom of the print, you can see how the artist really only removed thin strips of linoleum, and the landscape in the background has larger pieces cut away, leaving very little surface behind to hold the ink. Um, so if you click back a few slides, you can kind of compare this print with one of the woodcut prints, maybe um, one of Colwitz's uh, widows, but you can really compare the rounded lines of the clouds and the roundhouse here to those more sharp pointed lines and the coarseness of those woodcut prints. Um, really gives you a sense of how easily the linoleum can be cut and it really requires very little force because of that whereas the wood is much more dense and it takes a lot more kind of physical effort however because linoleum is softer yes it's easier to cut however that also means that um, you're sort of limited in the number of crisp impressions that you can produce because the linoleum block wears down more quickly than a wood block would uh, during printing. So in relief printing, the areas that are cut away um, are the negative space in the composition. But in intaglio printing, the areas that are cut away are actually the areas which hold the ink. So the recessed areas of the print are actually the positive space. Um, so the word intaglio comes from the Italian word intagliere, which means to cut into. Um, and in this process, the artist uses a sharp tool to cut or gouge into a metal plate. Then they ink across the entire plate and wipe away the raised surface, leaving ink in the recessed areas. And then a printing press squeezes the plate against the paper to transfer the ink. Now there are several variants of intaglio printing, again, each with their own sort of unique characteristics. Um, engraving is probably one of the most prominent of these techniques, and it dates to about the 15th and 16th centuries. In engraving, an artist cuts lines into a polished surface with a tool called a burin, B-U-R-I-N. Um, it's kind of pushed across the surface rather than pulled, like you would pull a pencil across the surface. Um, and so it's not really a free drawing process, but more of a careful and precise linear drawing process. But you can, could, <clears throat> excuse me, you can achieve quite fine details through this process. Now, the more pressure that the artist puts into um, the work as they push the burin across the surface, the deeper the cut and therefore the thicker and darker the lines of the print. Um, similar to woodcut, you can use hatching and cross hatching to create varying values within your print. Um, but the metal plate is typically much more durable than a wood block, so artists can use them more and therefore make and sell more copies of a work.
Here we have Albert Durer's Night, Death, and the Devil. This is an engraving from 1513. Um, quite a complex composition, really emphasizes the richness of the engraved lines. Um, and the precision of the medium really seems appropriate for the subject matter here. Um, so this is one of three large prints that was meant to show moral virtue. Um, so we have this noble Christian knight moving forward despite all the evil and death that surround him. So our knight on his horse, kind of prominent in the foreground here, just behind him we can see um, death, this old man who sits on sort of this pale, sickly horse. He holds an hourglass and a skull, which if you remember we spoke about um, the idea of memento mori, um, remember that you will die, um, these kind of motifs that symbolize death and remind us of the transience of life and that death will come for us all, um, even the most noble of knights. Now, behind him, we have this pig-faced devil with horns kind of following along. Um, the knight is meant to embody moral virtue. He's sort of undistracted, not looking backwards, despite knowing that he will soon face death. Um, Durer has really achieved a high level of detail here and created various surface textures. Um, you can kind of compare the armor to the fur or the coat of the horse as well as that of the dog, um, the trees and the foliage, etc. And really he's managed to pack such a high level of detail and and texture into quite a small composition. This is about nine and and five eighths inches by about seven and a half inches, so smaller than a normal sheet of paper. Um, and then again, you can sort of see the creation of various values through hatching and cross hatching, um, kind of used to model the figures and suggest um, three dimensional depth. Here's another by Durer, again, amazing precision. Um, this is his Adam and Eve from 1504. And he's using finely hatched and cross-hatched marks to create um, all of these various textures, shadows, and a high level of detail throughout this composition. Um, this work really shows his interest in idealized beauty um, and proportions of figures and sort of modeling of figures. Um, but it also has a lot of symbolism, which we won't get into the symbolism at this moment. We'll talk about that a bit later, probably in our um, themes and meanings section. Um, but he's depicted Adam and Eve um, in paradise in the Garden of Eden. Um, they are accepting the forbidden fruit, the apple, from this serpent here, who is presumably um, representative of the devil, right? Um, and so in this moment, they're sort of teetering on the edge of sin, um, which is kind of nicely echoed by the inclusion of this small goat, this small mountain goat kind of teetering on the edge of the cliff in the background here. Um, so, But again, you can really see how all of these fine etched lines um, are being used to create these surface textures and details and really model uh, the forms in the composition. We can also have dry point. Um, so when a line is scratched into a copper plate with a metal point that is pulled across the surface instead of pushed like it would be in an engraving, um, it creates this metal ridge called a burr on either side of the line, which catches ink and leaves a softer, more irregular line and creates kind of a velvety texture to the line. Um, however, the burr wears down pretty quickly um, so you don't have many additions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Typically, um, dry point, there are less than 25 additions within a series of prints. Um, so here we're looking at Max Beckmann. Um, he was a German expressionist, similar to Kathy Kollwitz. Um, but this is his Adam and Eve from 1917-1918. And he probably liked the uneven quality of line for the expression of um, sort of unpredictability and organic naturalness, um, which sort of suits the subject here. Adam and Eve have 
eaten the fruit of the tree of knowledge and are beginning to express shame at their own nakedness, um, starting to attempt to cover their genitals and hide themselves. So we have this sense of uncertainty about the future, of a growing worldliness kind of captured in this rougher, less finish looking uh, line quality. Now, similar to aquatint, dry point is often combined with other techniques. Um, for example, it's often done after etching um, to add more details to the plate um, and to the printed composition. Etching is another form of intaglio printmaking that also dates to about the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, and it's very similar to engraving, but it's a bit more fluid. Um, so with etching, a metal plate is covered in an acid resistant coating which the artist then scratches their design or their drawing into. Um, then the plate is submerged in an acidic bath and the exposed metal is sort of bitten or um, corroded off by the acid, um, which creates grooves to hold the ink. And from there, it's printed in the same way as an engraving. The surface is inked and then wiped, leaving the ink in the recessed areas um, and then pressed with a printing press against paper to really transfer that ink over. Um, so again, recessed areas on the carving, or excuse me, on the etching are what creates our positive image in the print. Um, so here we have Rembrandt's Adam and Eve from 1638, illustrating the same moment that Durer was illustrating just on the last slide, um, but with etching rather than engraving. So you can sort of get a sense of how etching is a bit more fluid and free. Um, in this composition, you can sort of see these spontaneous, almost sketchy lines. Um, using small incisions allows for greater control in incorporating subtle changes in line quality, um, such as like darkness or lightness, things that affect the values in a work. Um, and marking the plate or scratching the plate more in areas that are meant to be darker um, allows the artist to achieve um, darker values. So you can sort of see in the shadows around the feet or around kind of the lower abdomen here, how more and more marks are placed close together, even cross hatching over one another um, to create darker values in these shadows. Um, the figures here are still very well proportioned and quite idealized, like Durer's figures, um, but they're a bit more soft, kind of more fleshy bodies with more ordinary faces that express this sort of confused temptation as they contemplate whether or not to eat the apple or the forbidden fruit that they have just accepted from this very dragon-like serpent that kind of crawls up this tree on the right side of the composition. Here's another Rembrandt etching. This is Angel appealing to the shepherds from 1634. Um, and here he's really pushing the medium to its limits. Um, he's kind of emphasizing the play of light and dark to create this feeling that the angel and the light associated with her um, is sort of emerging out of this dense darkness. Um, you can also really see the softness of the leaves and trees all these tiny little details. Um, now remember, for an etching, um, the background is white because the recessed areas, the part that is scratched into the surface um, of the plate, are what hold the ink and therefore what creates the positive image in the print. So for all of this kind of empty sky or background space, um, Rembrandt would have had to fill it on the plate with intricate cross hatching and hatching to create such deep values and shadows here. I threw this slide in here so you can sort of look at some of the different intaglio processes um, side by side. So Durer's Adam and Eve um, engraving, then we have Rembrandt's Adam and Eve etching, and Max Beckman's Adam and Eve dry point. So all three artists depicting the same subject and really a similar moment from the narrative, um, but using different techniques, different media. Um, so you might consider how their choices in media and processes have affected the final composition here. So another type of intaglio printmaking is called aquatint. 
Um, this comes from the Italian acqua tinta, which means dyed water. Um, although water is not involved in this process at all, so the name is a little misleading. Um, now, so far we've been looking at linear printmaking techniques that create mostly black and white images, um, not a lot of mid-tones, but aquatint is a great way to achieve those grays, those mid-tones. So in aquatint, you sprinkle an acid-resistant powder called rosin onto a plate. Sometimes contemporary artists will use um, spray paint for this instead of this powder, but Either way, you sprinkle the powder onto the plate wherever you want to achieve gray tones. Then you heat the plate to melt that powder, um, and that creates this sort of mottled, acid-resistant coating that the artist then etches their design into. Then they put the plate into an acid bath, and the rosin leaves these irregular areas of the plate exposed and allows the metal to be eaten away and creates this sort of rough texture that is capable of holding ink. Um, now, the result is a softer, more organic texture than we've seen with etching or engraving or even woodblock printing. Um, now, the darkness of tone or value here varies according to how thick the acid-resistant coating was applied and how long the plate is left in acid. Um, additionally, the artist can use a brush um, to push the dry rosin powder around on the plate before they heat it um, to sort of paint with it and create this kind of watery effect um, in the final print. So we're looking at a work by Francisco Goya here. This is an aquatint um, from about 1818, um, simply titled Giant. Um, so here he's utilizing the wash-like nature of aquatint. He probably used what's called a rosin box, which is a device that allowed for more control over the distribution and amount of powder that was sprinkled onto the plate. Um, and then he likely scraped away some of the heated rosin in areas where he wanted to obtain darker values. Um, oftentimes, aquatint is combined with other techniques like etching or engraving or even dry point, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to create highlights and dark shadows, um, but here Goya is using strictly aquatin. He's also managed to create sort of this implied texture, a very soft, rich surface texture here, which really softens the contours of this fantastical creature. Um, a giant, kind of large, brooding, potentially dangerous, um, has been transformed into this mysterious, ominous being um, but not quite as dangerous or scary, more soft, um, maybe contemplative almost. Um, it kind of evokes a sense of uneasiness, but also a quietness or a calmness, maybe even a sense of sadness, as if this is sort of a, um, a melancholic giant. So here we have another print by Goya. This is his The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters from about 1799. And this is an example of aquatint in combination with etching. Um, so here Goya depicts an artist asleep at his drawing table, and around him we have all of these creatures, owls, bats, a lynx. Um, all of these are associated with evil or mystery in traditional Spanish folklore. Some of these creatures stare directly out at the viewer, allowing us to become an active participant within the image. Um, and then the caption itself, which is on the front of the desk here, um, reads, The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. And then this print was originally accompanied with a further caption that says, Imagination abandoned by reason produces impossible monsters. United with her, she is the mother of arts and the source of their wonders. Um, so here Goya is sort of arguing that both imagination and reason are required for the successful production of uh, art. Um, but anyway, you can sort of see this grainy texture and the different values that the aquatint process produces, um, creating these tonal variations that are not dependent on hatching or cross-hatching. Um, but Goya then uses those techniques, the hatching and the cross-hatching, as well as the process of etching um, in combination with this aquatint to sort of achieve 
the more extreme values within the composition. Um, so this kind of grainy mid-tone background comes from the aquatint process, whereas the really dark areas, the dark areas of value in the creatures and things, um, that comes from etching, from hatching and cross-hatching. Clinographic printmaking is a technique in which the print is made from an entirely flat surface. So it's not raised like in a relief or recessed or carved like an intaglio, um, but an entirely flat surface. One of the more prominent forms of this type of printmaking is lithography, which comes from the Greek literally meaning stone writing. Um, this process was developed by a German author in the late 18th century who was kind of broke and looking for a cheap way to print his newest play. Um, and so he developed the process of lithographic printing. So limestone is the traditional and still preferred surface um, for lith <clears throat> excuse me for lithographic prints, but contemporary artists also use things like metal plates made of zinc and aluminum. Um, either way, lithography is sort of a complex process that depends on the principle that oil and water do not mix. So, first, the artist draws their image on the stone with a greasy material, typically a grease-based lithographic crayon or pencil or a greasy ink called touche. Um, this blocks the stone's pores in that area, and then the stone is treated with an acidic solution that fixes the drawing to the stone um, and prevents it from smudging. Then the artist cleans the surface with a solvent, which appears to wipe away the drawing, but because the grease is already soaked into the stone's pores, it's still there, though this is a bit of an unnerving moment for young, kind of, unexperienced printmakers, but anyway. Now that the surface has been cleaned, it's ready for printing. The artist sponges the stone with water, which soaks into the ungreased areas, but is blocked from the areas covered in grease. Um, the stone is then inked with an oil-based ink that is repelled by the water, so it only sticks to the greased areas. The artist carefully aligns paper over the top of the stone and lightly presses down. Uh, often by passing it through a printing press, um, and this transfers the ink onto the paper. Um, many artists prefer lithography because they feel like they can work more freely. Um, it's, it's not as linear as etching or engraving. Um, they can work almost as freely as they can when they're drawing um, on paper. So in the early 1800s, uh, lithography was still a new process, but lithographs could be distributed widely via posters and other types of prints. Um, before the invention of modern printing presses, lithography um, provided illustrations for newspapers and magazines, um, which is how the French artist Onier Daumier um, made his living. He drew satirical or documentary lithographs and gave them to French newspapers to use as illustrations. So this is one such lithograph titled Rue Transnonian, um, which is the name of a street in Paris. Um, and it references an event that occurred during a period of civil unrest in Paris in 1834. So on April 15, 1834, a riot broke out in a Parisian workers quarter um, the French militia claimed that one of their number had been killed by a sniper's bullet that was shot from one of the apartments on Rue Transnonian Street, which happened to be very close to Damier's home. Um, the militia responded to this event by entering that apartment and killing all of the occupants, many of which were innocents. Um, and the very next day, Damier's lithograph was published. Um, so we have this man who had evidently been sleeping in this bed. We can see his nightcap and kind of nightgown here. Um, presumably pulled from bed and murdered. His wife to the right, to his right, our left, um, also dead. An elder parent to his left, also dead. And perhaps the most distressing or saddening aspect of this is the small child that has been 
sort of crushed underneath um, the figure. Presumably his child, maybe he was standing to protect them. Um, but we can see a nice use of foreshortening within the figure on the leg and the arm, as well as within the woman's body, um, really kind of making the composition more immediate and bringing the viewer into the scene. Um, we also get this contrast between the lights and darks that really increases the, the uh, emotional meaning here. It's sort of a brutally real kind of politically poignant composition with a highly emotional aspect to it as well. Um, and quite bold of Damier to publish this the day after it happened. So another method of planographic printing is seriography or silkscreen printing. This technique was first developed in China during the Song Dynasty, so between 960 and 1279. Um, and this process is based on the same principle as stenciling. Um, so a fine mesh silk cotton or synthetic fiber screen is mounted within a frame, sort of like a window screen. Um, the printmaker blocks out any areas that are not to be printed um, using tape, glue, or other materials. Um, so no ink passes through, um, and then a squeegee kind of pulls the ink across the rest of the screen. Now, you can have photographic silk screens by blocking the areas using a photosensitive masking material, which is quite impressive, but we won't get super into that. Um, silk screening is really versatile. You can use it to create clothing, packages, flat prints, posters, etc. Um, it's really one of the only printmaking processes discussed that is not a reversal. It is, quote unquote, right reading, meaning that it goes the same direction on the picture as it does on the printing surface. Um, remember, I mentioned earlier with things like woodcuts and etching, really all the other printmaking processes we've discussed. If you have words or letters, you have to carve them or um, draw them in reverse so that when you print, they come out um, in the right or readable. Um, in silk screening, you don't have to do any reversing. Um, it comes out exactly the way it is on the screen. Silk screening is a great way to create large additions without the loss of quality um, because your screen doesn't deteriorate like uh, your wood relief carving or your etched line might deteriorate. But like woodblock printing, um, each color must be printed separately, so it takes a bit of planning and process kind of control, um, making sure that you line your images up on the paper, things like that. Andy Warhol is an American pop artist who really recognized the possibilities of silkscreen, not only for making images, but for commenting on American culture. Um, he began his career in the 1950s as a commercial and graphic artist, um, in the 60s, he started making prints of American celebrities such as Elvis, like we see here, also Marilyn Monroe and Elizabeth Taylor, um, really obsessed with this idea of fame, um, and he continued making prints like this on into the 80s. But silkscreen was really great for making images and commenting on American culture. It was a cheap, efficient process. He could have other people do it for him. In fact, Warhol employed a host of assistants um, that operated with assembly line efficiency to sort of mass produce these prints. Um, in 1965, he named his art studio The Factory. It was this sort of large foil lined industrial space that served as a social and creative melting pot. Um, and so his assistants worked within the factory. Um, this also really highlights the commercial aspect of this. Think about the time period. This is um, the 1950s and 60s, post-war America, really the explosion of capitalism and consumerism here. So he's kind of combining art with life, art with business, and critics were quite scandalized by Warhol's open embrace of this market culture. This is Warhol's Marilyn Diptych of 1962. Um, Marilyn Monroe was an iconic actress at this time, right? Um, and she was found dead in her apartment in 1962. Warhol produced this image uh, 
pretty immediately after that. It sort of memorializes her iconic on-screen image, though not necessarily her real self. So using silkscreen printing, he has transferred a publicity picture of Marilyn, this sort of flat, bland image. Her bleach blonde hair, her red lips and blue eyes, um, these have all been highlighted, sort of creating a caricature of the real person. Um, the diptych format here, which diptych being kind of a two-paneled um, painting, um, this has sort of religious connotations, which we'll talk a bit more about that another time. But um, that sort of implies that Marilyn was perhaps a martyred saint or goddess, perhaps worshipped in a way. Now, silkscreen is particularly great for printing large areas of flat, heavy color. And so Warhol has really used this technique to emphasize the flatness or lack of depth within this image of Marilyn, really showing how it had become more of a commodity rather than a genuine attempt to capture her individuality. He also made multiple prints of this, um, and so the smudging here that you see is actually caused by printing over and over without cleaning and re-inking his screen. Um, and then we also have this high contrast between the black and white um, and the color, <clears throat> excuse me, black and white on one panel, color on the other. Um, the black and white is sort of connotative of perhaps newspapers and TV. And then as we move left to right on this side, the image becomes a bit more distorted, then it fades out altogether. So really thinking about the idea of celebrity presence, um, and how society views celebrities um, really as objects, but not objects that last forever, objects that fade into the past or are forgotten after their death or after their relevance has passed. And another example, this is Warhol's 30 are better than one from 1963. Uh, this time pulling from art history, another iconic image. This is um, using Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. And here Warhol is thinking about sort of the advertising consumerist culture and the idea that more is always better. Um, Warhol was interested in the mass production of art. He heard that Pablo Picasso had made 4,000 artistic masterpieces in his lifetime, and Warhol himself wanted to make 4,000 prints in a single day. Um, he actually only ever managed to produce 500 in a month, but that's still rather ambitious considering uh, his attempts to make art more accessible to uh, the public. But anyway, here his repetition of imagery sort of comments on mass production and mass media. Um, the idea that the more we experience something, the more desensitized we get towards it. So as we consume mass media or mass produced goods, mass culture, uh, we can often become desensitized to those images or the people and ideas that are in those images. Um, or the sort of readily available imagery causes it to lose its significance. Um, Warhol here is also sort of undermining the idea of fine art or high art um, there's this tendency to place a higher value either financially or aesthetically um, on an artwork if it's original or unique. And so by taking something that is already an iconic work of art history and reproducing it in a new work of art, he's removing that originality or that um, kind of unique quality. But does that make it any less of an artwork? Not necessarily. Um, these are rather impersonal, neutral images. And remember, these are Warhol's designs, but his hand was not involved in the making. Um, he had a whole factory of assistants working for him, right? So really leaning into these ideas, uh, consumerist culture and, and mass media, things like that. Esther Hernandez makes these screen printed posters. Um, she's made hundreds of them, and these are really to assert Latino identity and denounce the working conditions of Mexican-American laborers. 
Um, so Hernandez transforms the cheerful sun-made raisin branding into a grim message of protest um, against the <clears throat> Excuse me. On the left, she's speaking directly against the use of pesticides um, in sort of a response to her own family's exposure to pesticides and polluted water in the California's um, San Joaquin Valley. Um, the skeletal figure sort of acts as this memento mori and draws attention to the dangers of the chemicals that are listed below. Um, so you can kind of pick out these subtle almost ironic or satirical changes that she's made to this um, advertisement unnaturally grown with insecticides, miticides, herbicides, and fungicides. Um, whereas in a real raisin ad, this would be kind of a boast or a, a, a brag about how natural and healthy their product is, right? That's not necessarily the truth. Um, on the right, we have one from 2008. This is Sun Raid. Um, where she has reimagined the ad to condemn the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. Um, the caption here says, <clears throat> excuse me, caption says, unnaturally harvested, deportation guaranteed. So the skeleton is now wearing an ICE wrist monitor and um, traditional indigenous garments. So commenting on um, the experiences of immigrants within the country.